Well, hey, everybody. Oh, thanks, Javier. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Cut Flower Pest Management using IPM. Uh, my name is Hannah Whitehead, and I'm an extension educator with the VEG team uh, here at UMass. Um, and so before we get started, I want to quickly do some uh, background. So this is part of a grant that we got to um, expand cut flower resources for farmers in Massachusetts. Uh, we're really excited about it. We've been getting more and more questions about cut flowers, and it's such an exciting field. Um, and so we're looking forward to offering more resources uh, to cut flower growers. Um, and so there's this workshop today, and then next week at the same time, we're going to have another webinar about pre-production planning for cut flower uh, systems. Um, and then we're also going to have a couple of on-farm uh, twilight meetings this summer, so keep an eye out. We're going to have information about that in the Veg Notes newsletter. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping. So we're going to record this webinar, and I'm going to send it out to all of you next week. Um, so if you miss anything or you want to rewatch anything, uh, you'll have it uh, next week. Um, at the end of the webinar, um, I'm going to, like the, once it closes out, you'll be brought to a poll. Um, so if you could, or to a little bit of a post-webinar survey. So if you could take that survey, uh, that helps us get uh, funding in the future. So we appreciate that. And then finally, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and I'll keep an eye on the chat. And so will Betsy. Um, and so uh, we can answer your questions throughout the presentation. Um, and so, yeah, so we're really excited to have Betsy Lamb here. Um, she comes from uh, Cornell. She's an extension professor there and she does work um, focused on horticulture, ornamental crops, and integrated pest management, has, and has been doing a lot of work related to cut flowers lately. Uh, so we're really excited to have her here, and I'm going to uh, pass it along to you, Betsy. All right, I will see the make, make sure I can share the slides, which I tried before. It's a lot of, <laughs> lot of work. As we always say, can you see those all right, and you can hear me okay? Let's see if I guess it's clear. Yeah, see the chat here. Okay, perfect. All right. So hello, everyone. And thank you for coming on a nice sunny afternoon when you might want to be out actually cleaning up your gardens to get ready for spring. Um, I wouldn't mind being out there, too. <laughs> but this is this is also useful and important. So I'm going to talk about cut flower pest management using IPM. I work for the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. I'm the coordinator for ornamentals. And cut flowers is something that in New York State, we had at one point a research person looking at variety trials but when he retired, there hasn't been much work on pest management or on, on cut flowers, cut flowers at all. There's been some in the county, in the counties that people have done. So it's really just getting started. And um, so I'm learning lots. I learned something. I think every time we have a program, I learn something about pest management for cut flowers. So, and I, I just, I put all these pictures on here just so you can see, we're talking about insects and diseases and um more mammals and birds. I'm not going to talk specifically necessarily about them. Weeds, all sorts of things. Those all qualify as pests. And I'm mostly talking about some sort of the, the idea of using integrated pest manager or integrating your pest management methods um, for cut flower production. So let's see if you can make this go forward. There we go. So, whoops, I meant two. So you can put this in the chat. This is just to get to you all used to the fact that you can add things to the chat. What do you grow and where do you grow it? Or give us any information that you'd like to um, about yourselves. Let's see if we get any answers. It is Friday afternoon and everybody might be getting kind of sleepy. Dahlias, yep. Wow, oh, yep. Oh, edible cut flowers in Quebec. That's cool. And that's it, it is also interesting looking at some of this too, the, the diversity of things that people grow just if they're growing cut flowers, but then often it's cut flowers plus vegetables plus fruit plus whatever else. And so that makes sometimes it makes the pest management a little bit more complicated. Um and you know, so you you need to know. Cut flower growers have to know a lot of information and you'll see, I'm asking you for even more of it. So thanks for putting that in, I'll keep going, but feel free to, to keep adding that information. I'm gonna ask you one more question in theory. Oops, <laughs> do you think you use integrated pest management already? Oh God, another person, another Quebec. I tried, that's the perfect answer, yes. <laughs> 
So, and I think integrated pest management, because it's in a, an integrated program, is definitely a work in progress. And uh, you will see um, in some of the other things that I've got, it's like, it's easy for me as an extension person to say, you should do this, 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 this. But you have to fit it into your system. It has to work for you. And so, um, you know, I had I was teaching a class and I was telling somebody about, I think, sanitation. And they, they were like, well, I can't get every little bit. And I'm like, yes, I know you can't get every little bit. The point is, are you trying? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to get rid of that material? And so, you know, and, and how does it work with everything else that you have to do with that at any given time? Because you probably always have about six things that you should be doing, 12 things you could be doing, and a few other things you'd like to be doing. So that's just the way the system works. So the major components of an IPM plan are to monitor and scout. So you need to be out looking for what's out there. Yes, somebody wrote, just as I said that, somebody said they scout. Um, so that's actually the basis of all pest management, no matter what method of pest management you're using. If you don't know what you've got, how do you know what to apply? And in fact, if you don't know what you've got, should you actually be applying anything at all? Um, and then once you've found something, either you already know what it is, which you get better at as you go along, or you have to find out how to get it identified. And then is management. So then the next piece is, okay, we've got all these potential tools for management. What should we use? And with IPM, we always emphasize cultural, physical, and biological controls. And I'll give you tons more information on all of this as we go along. There's a couple other pieces is one is determining if your controls are working. So whatever you're doing for management, is it actually working? And make sure you keep records so you know what you saw, when you saw it, and I'll talk more about that as well. And then, you know, it's gonna, it's not a linear process. It's not even a circular process. It's a circular process with arms where you keep monitoring and you keep identifying and you keep changing what you're doing and keep, <laughs> keep records. All right, so what is monitoring and scouting? Um, it's consistent and recurring inspection of all your plants to identify plant problems. So the idea is it's not a one and done, sadly, it would be nice if it was, but time marches on and so do the past problems. So you you need to do it, you need to do it consistently. It's a lot better, a lot easier to get good information if you have a plan and a and a schedule. Um, and so the intent is to do more effective pest management, to save money and to have better plant quality, all things we'd really like to see. And it is usually combined with identification. These, and I have a lot of greenhouse pictures, but I've tried been trying to get more cut flower pictures to add in uh, just uh, in terms of making it more relevant. And you can see the people down in the set picture on the bottom have on what we call optivizers, uh, which is a magnify, magnification device to help look for what various things that you're looking for. And my computer just decided to turn off, but it's going to turn back on again here in a second. <laughs> I said it was working well, and I should have known. Okay, so how many how many slides forward did I go? Oh, just right. So what are you trying to find out? And I know the slides are filled with information. And here's one situation where um, saying, "Oh yeah, do all these things." It's when you look at it, it becomes a little bit overwhelming. So you want to know what pests you have, how many of them. What development stage are they? When do they arrive? It'd always be nice to say, we'd like to see the first one. You'll probably never see the first one, but it would be nice to see somewhere in the earlies <laughs> before they become a huge problem. And the other thing, we always show pictures of like this aphid picture where it's just covered with aphids. We'd like you to catch them before that. And so they're harder to see when there's not as many. Um, where are they? Are they on all the crops? Are they on some crops? Are there hot spots? in regionally or you know in low by location or by by species that you're growing um and then again is your management working over time in order to know that you have to track the populations over time and then all this goes into your records so creating a good scouting system is not instantaneous it's not like you just walk in and oh my gosh you've got it all under control and you're you're ready to go uh, it's a it is a process that is developed as you go as you go through it so if you create a scouting plan, that makes it a little bit easier. So, um, and this is a, a diagram that was drawn for a class, which I'll mention in a minute. Um, they are looking at a greenhouse, but they made a plan of what benches do they have? What's on the benches? So what rows do you have? Where are the different crops that you have over time? Because I know it changes over time through a season. Um, and where are you going to be collecting your scouting data? You can't possibly look at every plant. Well, unless you're better than... Certainly better than I am, but it's not too difficult to be a better scout than I am. But so the idea is to make it easy. So 
it's planned and consistent. You start knowing, okay, we always see aphids first on this plant. We always see thrips on this type of plant. Um, and so knowing the past history makes it easier to reduce the amount of scouting that you have to do and making it more efficient. So when are you scouting? So pre-crop, pre, pre uh, if you've got a greenhouse, we talk about scouting the weeds before you put anything in there. In a field, you might also be scouting the weeds or looking to see what's out there already so that you know if you're gonna be planting into a situation where there are potentially some problems all, already. Incoming plant material is a big one. We don't worry quite as much about seeded crops. Um, there are a few things that can be spread uh, by the seed, but we don't have a huge problem with that in cut flowers. Um, incoming cuttings, though, is another thing. And um, I, as I said, I keep learning things. So not just cuttings, but also, or seedlings, but also um, corms, for example, uh, gladiola strips come in on, potentially can come in on the corms and you will not notice them unless you're really looking for them. So making sure you're scouting what's coming in is a good thing during production makes sense. And then sometimes before harvest is really important because you need to know what the quality is of what's going out. And so um, the one nice thing that um, you're doing, one nice thing that you have with cut flower farms is you're out there all the time because you're harvesting so much. So it makes it a little bit easier to see what's going on because you get good at it because you have to look at everything all the time. And then this, I, when I start talking about this, I love this, this gift because it's like, yep, this is what it feels like. My head's exploding. When was the first indication there was a problem? What crops was it on? When did you see it? Was it associated with certain environmental conditions? What other information would help making scouting easier the next time? And then the concept of making sure you take pictures for your records and sending in samples if you need things to be identified. So uh, there's a couple things UMass does have uh, a diagnostic lab and that's the link, which if you just Google plant diagnostics and UMass, you will get it. Um, and I'm sure if you ask Hannah, she can tell you all the information you'd need to know. Uh, there's also, this is an interesting app that's that's run by a bunch of different states, but I think many I think anyone can send in pictures uh, and they'll do some diagnostics for you as well. And I believe it's a free, it's a free app. So, um, you know, if, if you need something, um, you can try it out. It means you need to be able to take good pictures uh, if you're gonna send them in and ask for diagnosis with that. And you may get some questions on, could you go and take me some more pictures to show um, more, get more information? And then the concept of collecting information. If you've got some kind of a scouting sheet or form, something that makes it easy for you, something that makes sense for your brain, uh, as as to where you're going to put this information, um, you know, creating a scouting app on a phone is nice. We've, we're working on that for greenhouse, but uh, I haven't seen any for cut flowers. But some way to at least take notes of what did you see, when did you see it, and and then over time, what are you doing about it? And collecting more information that you think you're going to need is always a good idea because you never know when. It's like, oh yeah, there's that one thing that I wrote down that, that actually tells me something about this pest that I needed to know. So this is our Greenhouse Scout School. We're in the middle of it at the moment. Thank you, uh, Genevieve, to put, for putting in the link there. Um, a Greenhouse Scout School that we're actually running at the moment and running it, as, it's both as webinars as in a certificate program. The certificate program is closed, but if you're interested in the webinars, um, just put your name in the email or send me an email. I actually put my email in there or actually maybe... Hannah or Genevieve can put my my email in the chat. Um, there's still uh, three week three weeks left, three webinars left. It's all on scouting. It's aimed at greenhouses, but um, it the most of the information is relevant to cut flowers and other pests as well. These are some of the students from when we taught it last fall. The best selfie we got. I like this picture. I've been putting it in everything I do. And if you if you sign up now. Um, you can, I'll get, send you the recordings of all the first ones that have already happened. That's my advertisement for the day. Thank you. So, okay, now you've found something. Now what are you gonna do about it? Now you have to identify what it is. And so there's some things that will help you and sometimes knowing some of the behavior and the look also of the, of the pest makes it a little bit easier. So this is botrytis season. And when you're in a greenhouse, botrytis might look like this, called gray mold. You can understand why. When it's, when it's nice and fuzzy like that, it's easy to identify. 
It doesn't necessarily start out that way, but it will get that way. But it likes cool temperatures, high relative humidity, low light. So if you can you can get it in your greenhouse when you're starting things easily, if things are too moist, um, there are essentially spores everywhere. So it's not something that you can necessarily avoid. And it's also encouraged by dead material on leaves. So if you have, for some reason, you might have hanging baskets or something over what you're starting, um, be, be cognizant of what's falling off them onto the leaves below where you might get um, botrytis starting. But <laughs> there's going to be a but in also in all of these. This is Botrytis cinerara and, and Botrytis peony. So this is Botrytis of peony. And it doesn't look at all like that gray fluffy stuff because in a greenhouse, there's not as much air current and so forth. But you get some of the browning. So if you had the browning on the foliage, this is pretty heavy, but you might, you probably, you might have still gotten good flowers out of this. So you might not do anything much about this. If you're still, if you're seeing the lesions up on the flower buds, now you've lost your harvest. And you can get lesions on the stems because this one will also overwinter in the soil. So if you're seeing a lot of it, you might need to move where you put your peonies in next. And I probably wouldn't dig up the old peonies and move them because they may bring it with them, um, I would start a new peony bed. But, and there's, again, there's other management methods for this as well. But sometimes if you think of, of Botrytis only looking like that fluffy gray, fluffy gray mold, you might not identify this as Botrytis right now. Again, knowing the behavior helps with thrips. They like tight spaces like flowers. This is Western flower thrips. There are other th thrips and gladiolus thrips I already mentioned, and they're a little bit different. They tend to like tight spaces too, but they like them in the corn. Um, so you have to get them out to see them. So in greenhouses, we use yellow sticky cards, which works well. And that picture is there just to show you how small they are. They're not this nice big thing here. They're these little yellowish things here. Um, but if you're trying to find out if you've got them in your flowers, you can shake your flowers into a plastic bag. You might breathe on the flowers first, which seems crazy, but the carbon dioxide slows them down. And sometimes if you're tapping them onto a surface, breathing into the into the flowers, slows them down enough to see them. Um, you can do tap tests onto white surfaces or whatever. We like um, white Frisbees or platters that have edges so the wind doesn't blow them off when you're trying to see what's going on. And sometimes with them, something like thrips, because they're not evident necessarily, um, they, as they're hiding, you might not know you've got them until you see the damage. And Again, this kind of damage sort of on leaves, on foliage, it's often sort of silvery and you will see little black specks in there, little fecal specks mixed in. In this picture, you can see the thrips too, but you don't always see the thrips. Sometimes you just see the silvering in these little black dots. And on flowers, what you see is color clearing because they're actually um, damaging the cells so the contents come out, so all the color pigments come out as well. But here's the gladiolus thrips. These come in with and survive on the corms. And in this case, if you saw just this flower, you might say, oh, maybe that's a virus. Or even these leaf patterns, you might think, oh, no, I don't know. But so you, again, looking closely and getting some more information often or, get, often or getting help uh, with identification um, will help you out because these don't act quite the way that Western flower thrips do, for example. And then this is the difference between powdery and downy mildew. And we have a lot of species that get both powdery and downy mildew. So powdery mildew is on the upper surface and it's white and fuzzy. Downy mildew is on the under surface, down and under. That's how we remember. Um, you can often see some symptoms on the, whoops, <clears throat> on the upper surface, also all more yellow. And it, there, it's interesting because it's delimited by the veins. Now you might also say, well, that looks like foliar nematodes. Um, which is uh, another another thing that some plants get, although not I've not heard of it in cut flowers so much. But when you flip it over, you've got sort of gray fuzz on the back sides of the leaves. And it's important to know which you have, and they're both mildews, so okay, they're both mildews, but they're actually not even the same kind of organism. Powdery mildew is a fungus, and downy mildew is a water mold, even though they look both fuzzy like we think of fungi. And then Downy mildew likes it cooler and wetter and powdery mildew, like, mildew likes it warmer and drier, at least in part. So um, knowing what you've got for identification is important, but also for management sometimes. And then there's things like this where you can't just say you've got powdery mildew because they're often very crop specific. 
And so that could be both good, good, or, good or bad. So for example, here you can see the same one affects aster, chrysanthemum, and solidago, which is goldenrod, uh, and because they're all in the composite family. Um, but it doesn't affect delphinium and larkspur, they have their own. And so that tells you something about scouting for it. It also tells you something maybe about whether or not you put those crops close together if you tend to have a problem with powdery mildew on one of them and not on the others. And then we're always looking at pat patterns over the whole planting instead of just the plant. This is an example of something that's abiotic. So with insects and diseases, they rarely affect the whole stand at one time. Um, it'd be very difficult for a disease to come in and hit all the plants exactly at the same time. This is in this greenhouse is actually ethylene damage. It looks like what we think of with some virus symptoms where you get kind of strappy leaves. Um, but the color, the, green, the leaf color is fine. It's just the leaves are all misshapen. And so yeah, this is an abiotic issue, but you do get abiotic issues out in the cut flowers too. And you need to know the difference. There's no point in spending money on management thinking you've got a disease or insect pest if it's not something that's living. And sometimes you scout for other things than aphids. And sorry, other things than aphids. Yes, other things than the pest itself. Now this upper picture, there's enough aphids on here. You'd probably notice the aphids. You wouldn't need these cast skins. But sometimes you'll see these little white things and think, oh, is that white fly? But it's actually the skins and it's always on the upper surface because the aphids are on the undersurface of the leaf above. They also produce a lot of honeydew. Other sucking insects also produce honeydew. And then it's unusual in a cut flower crop and in some crops, crops that are sticking around for a long time, you'll get this black mold that's actually not growing on the plant. Um, it's growing in the, in the sugars that are in this honeydew. Um, and honeydew, if you've got too much of it, makes everything sticky. So that's also unpleasant. Um, but the sooty mold can interfere with photosynthesis, so it can have some effect on the plant growth. I'm getting close to finishing up with with uh, with sort of you know thinking about how you might go about this, but then we'll get into some more specifics of type of management. And so, if if people have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We like it's nice to have tools when you're scouting. Um, makes life a little bit easier. You know, we use a lot of sticky cards in greenhouses. They're not great in fields because they get dusty and dirty so fast that they become less valuable, but you can use them. This is one putting them in a field edge, but something that might also work <clears throat> that has the same kind of idea is a trap crop. And this one, if we're talking about flea beetles, for example, um, flea beetles are amazing. In a garden, you will have nothing. And then it's as if they're spontaneous generation and they're on everything. Um, and so using something like radish, because the seed is cheap and it comes up early, will tell you if you've got, um, you've got flea beetles in the field before maybe they're on your plants and so you can protect your plants before there's a problem. This is showing trap crop in between two rows of a, not a full cut flower, but of, uh, of a cash crop. Um, sometimes also putting it on the edge or maybe even putting it farther away. So it's pulling the insect away from your cash crop uh, is another option. And then sometimes you use what's most attractive on your farm. So if you know that, you, that whatever you put out first that gets whatever it is, use that <clears throat> as your trap crop to determine whether something is there or not. Because some pests actually blow in from, come in, blow, blow in from the south. Uh, and so they have to move up the coast. And so there's no point in doing management before you have to. Um, but, you know, so then you'll actually know when they're there. There's a few things we have of tools that are like this, like an Agdea kit for virus testing, not very many. They're a, a bit expensive, but they do work well in terms of <clears throat> knowing what virus you have or if indeed it is a virus. Um, so that's that's one thing we have. And then this is another one in terms of Lepidopterus pests. Um, and there are growing degree day models for some other things as well. Um, NUA, the Network for Environmental Weather Applications, doesn't have any cut flower models yet. Maybe I'll get some in there. Um, but there are pests that are in there that might be relevant that might be relevant. Um, and also you can find the growing degree day requirements in other places, or you can find the, the required ones in other places and look your own up in NUA. Um, this is an example, for example, of growing of uh, 
European corn borer, which is a, a pest of cut flowers. And so knowing that, okay, when we start accumulating heat, usually it's over 50 degrees. So if you've got uh, an average uh, day temperature over 50, you figure out how many degrees over 50, and then you start adding those up over time. So um, when you start accumulating, you get your first th spring moths at about 374. You can see as the numbers go up, the development increases in the insect. So it's a way of evaluating the, the rate of development of different insect pests. Okay, I'm gonna take a breather. Let's let that, see if there's any questions because I can talk really fast. <laughs> And I think folks can you can put questions or comments in the chat and you're, you yep. can also unmute if you have something to say. Their heads have blown up. <laughs> if they haven't, they might. Okay. <laughs> Feel free to put them in as we go along and I'll just keep yakking. Okay, so now you found it, you've identified it. Now you need to figure out how to manage it. Or actually the first question is, do you need to manage it? And there's some other pieces of information that go in there too. But the concept of integrated pest management is that we look at all, <clears throat> nope, I'm going to talk about row covers. And um, 50 degrees, yes, we use 50 degrees as a day average temperature over the uh, day. So the usual thing is to take the max and the min for the day, maximum temperature and the minimum temperature, average them, and use that as the average temperature we're talking about, and then subtract 50. You can get much more granular than that if you feel like it, but that is the most most common thing. And yep, I'm gonna talk about row covers a, a bit. Um, so what the idea is that you have, you have as many tools there as available to you. And depending on your preferences and your process of uh, production, for example, if you're certified organic, then you have different pesticides that you're allowed to use and others that you're not. If you're not certified organic, but you're you're trying to do organic methods, you may use pesticides for some pro crops that you just really can't grow without them, but not in other places. But I will tell you that in in general, I think the, the cultural and physical ones, cultural in particular, is really a basis of of all pest management because some of those are just kind of common sense. So we're gonna talk about that too. I figured I had to put things that moved in occasionally. It's Friday afternoon, we all get kind of sleepy <laughs> by about three o'clock. And it's just about three o'clock where I do anyway. So we're gonna talk about cultural, physical, and biological. I'm not gonna talk much about chemical, just a little bit um, because we could do a whole class on chemical control. And because my what I've seen is that for the most part, a lot of cut flower growers are trying to use as few pesticides as possible. And that works well for, for us. Um, and But the other thing to remember is that most probably pest management requires some advanced planning. It's, it's not necessarily something you can do on the fly. So the more you know about what you're likely to have, um, the better off you'll be. So cultural is is usually it's there's two pieces of cultural. It's either sanitation where you're kind of cleaning things up, so you're not leaving uh, weed seeds that can go to weed heads on flat on weeds that can go to seed, or you're not leaving plants that are full of disease or insects there. And then the other one is to do something about changing the environment. And tillage, solarization, cover cropping, those are all somewhat management of the environment um, that we just tend to use for weeds rather than for diseases. So the other thing about cultural and physical control is, again, understanding the biology and the behavior of the pest always helps. So these are actually both beneficial insects. Um, but if you thought about how fast one could move from one plant to the next, this guy, this little mite, has to walk. And he's not going to walk as far as this one can fly. So if you found a pest, man pest in one area, you have an idea of if you are treating it with something like a chemical, do you have to treat the whole area or can you just treat that plant where you find it and the plants right around it? Or can you remove that plant, check the plants around it, and then you know remove it and bag it so you're not spreading it through the field? Uh, and then you don't need to go um, you don't need to go farther than that area where you first find found it because they're not likely to fly farther into the field and, and all throughout the field. Thanks for putting the new uh, the new degree day calendar or calculator. 
So there's also things with spread. This is an example from powdery mildew. So I said there were spores, or for, sorry, the spores are, are um, move on wind currents. Some things were, move on water splash and some things insects carry and some things we carry around. But this one is one that the spread by, by wind. Um, so it also has some particular environmental conditions that it likes. It likes cool, humid nights and warm, dry days. It doesn't need free water on the leaves um, for the spores to germinate, but high humidity at night helps. Um, but the big thing about this is it survives over winter in these resting spores. So if you look at the white mycelium, and mycelium is what we think about sort of for fungal growth, and these little dark spots in there, those are all uh, resting spores. So they can fall off, or if you leave the, if you just cut the plant material, they'll survive in the in the soil in the winter or in plant debris. And so um, this is a situation where sanitation and removing these stems is important, and then also not throwing them in your compost unless you have compost that you're not actually using to put back on the field. Then there are even a few, and hops is one of them, where powdery mildew can survive as mycelium in dormant buds. And that makes life even more complicated because then it's in the plant if it's a perennial plant. But so knowing something about how the plant spreads, disperses and survives is important to knowing what you should or shouldn't do in terms of how you handle it. This is again, using that concept of trap crop, but looking more at dispersal. So if you know that something moves in from outside the field, it doesn't survive in the field, this is an example, a vegetable example, but look again, at collards around cabbage or blue Hubbard squash around yellow summer squash. I don't know why I want to do that. It always decides to move. Our cherry peppers around bell peppers. It it The insects will move into those areas first because they hit them first. And then what you might do is you might do chemical control just on those trap crop rows. And you may never harvest those trap crop rows. They may be just, just there to collect the pests and keep them out of the, the crop that you're you're growing. Now it does take space. And if you have a small amount of space, um, it's something you need to think about. But you know, if you can get by with a couple of rows of the trap crop and then multiple rows of the crop, maybe that's maybe that's worth it to have the space used. So <clears throat> let's start talking about cultural control. Um, this is, I saw this list somewhere, Morgan State University, and it made me laugh partly because it says that slugs like banana splits. I can't verify that, but then who doesn't like banana splits? But the concept of if you if you give them what they don't like and don't give them what they do like, it's how you're going to control them. Now, we always have this balance. It's fine to say, oh, dry conditions. Well, yes, but dry conditions are also going to affect the plants that you're growing. So we were hoping to find a happy medium. They don't like salt. I wouldn't probably be salting my crop growing area. Although there are people who talk about using that for weed management, but as long term, it seems like a bad idea. So you're always trying to balance what level works well for the crop you're growing and doesn't work as well for the pests you're trying to control. And so uh, with cultural control, here's one where you're actually removing them was once they're inside the stem and this is a European corn borer larva inside a stem. We've cut the side off so you can see it. This hole is where it's pushing all of its frass out. So sometimes you'll see this clump of goo on the side of the stem that tells you that there's a European corn borer in there. But you can also imagine this stem could easily either break off or just tip over because there's nothing on the inside of it anymore. Plus anything that's above this point is probably gonna be flagging at least because the vascular tissue has been eaten. Um, but if you cut this out below where the larva is, and then don't drop it on the ground because it might pupate in there as well. So cut it and take it away. Now you've removed that larva. It's not going to turn into an adult, a pupa and then an adult, and it's not going to lay eggs for another generation. And the same thing at the end of the season is to clean up your stems. If you've had European corn borer, just clean them all up um, so the pupa won't overwinter in those stems and start the process early the next spring. Here's solarization, which um, it's interesting. Tarping's getting a lot of uh, press at the moment and I'll show you tarping in a second. This is for weed management and what you're doing is <clears throat> changing the environment. This looks like white plastic. It's actually clear plastic. There's just condensation on it. It's a project that we did um, for putting in a beneficial habitat. But UMaine's done some work where they said in the spring and summer, even two weeks is enough 
where the sunlight comes through the plastic and actually heats up the soil. So you can see we've prepared the soil already. We tilled it and it's moist and then we cover it for a few weeks. Um, and then this is several months later after we took it off. You can see that the solarization, there actually was killing of some of the weed seeds. Um, but interestingly, we discovered that Portulaca loved it under there. Personally, like loved it under there and grew very happily under those um, the, in the hotter conditions. Um, but that's a way to actually heat the soil, not just the plastic, by using clear plastic. If you're using dark plastic, <clears throat> what you're doing is actually preventing sunlight from reaching the soil. And so um, it's a different process for getting to the same place so that there's no sunlight coming through. And so the plants, the seed, weeds are, weed seeds are, if they germinate, they then die. So you're mostly heating the plastic, although there is some heating of the soil, but not quite as much. It is interesting to see how long that solar, that uh, tarping effect works. I've done that in my yard also. And, you know, it, it's not like they just come back immediately as soon as you take it off, but it does take a certain amount of time. So if, again, if you have little space, it's hard to find the space to do this. But if you've got a, a problem, weed problem that you just can't get around, this might be one way to deal with it. Either one. Another thing, cultural control for something like botrytis. So we talked about sanitation already. But another one is increasing the air circulation so that you're reducing the microclimate around the plant so that you don't have that warm, damp, or cool, damp uh, microclimate around the plant. And you can do that with spacing, with road orientation, and then also using drip or trickle irrigation rather than overhead irrigation to keep the leaves dry. So again, knowing something about how that disease progresses helps to know um, what you might do. And I just, this is my, I drive tractors like I draw lines. So the rows are a little wonky in both cases, but you can see if you're looking at predominant wind direction, if, you're, if your rows are going this way, the wind's gonna move down the rows and then we'll also get sort of mixed up by those plants. And so you'll get a lot more air movement around the plants. If, it, if your rows are going this way, they tend to hit this first row and they might get through some places, but then they're gonna get another row. So by the time you get into several rows in, you're not getting very much air movement. And so um, you're just not getting the effect of the, the, the sort of natural ventilation that you can use to make your plants to, to help with disease management. Hey, Betsy, we have a quick question on European corn yeah. borer. Uh, someone asked whether they're common on snapdragons. Oh, that's a good idea. Good question. Your other slide. As far as I know, they like everything. I know certainly I've heard them on dahlias, um, but I wouldn't be surprised to hear them hear that they are also on snapdragons. And if other people know the answers to these questions too, um, feel free to put in answers. You know, we don't. I, it's a it's a it's a community. That's one of the things I like about cut flower growers. It definitely is a community, and we're sort of sharing information because none of us have all of it. <clears throat> so let's talk about physical physical control methods. I love this picture because I'm not sure who's sassing who. The woman putting up the fence is sassing the deer or the deer sassing the woman putting up the fence like, oh, I'll figure out a way. That's a pretty tall fence. They probably won't get off over it. So with physical control, you're actually usually adding something to prevent um, prevent them getting where they where you don't want them to be. So row covers were mentioned Isolation for diseases, if you're bringing in plant materials and you're not sure if there's a problem, don't mix them in with everything else uh, at, right at first. Putting up fencing for mammals, our favorite mammal, four-legged one, <laughs> beast is deer, I think. And then plastic mulch or landscape feed, landscape fabric to control weeds. Um, here's an example, if you have variegated cutworm, the some of the management tillage, because sort of cultural, sort of physical, the idea being, that you're breaking up the plant material that it might have overwintered in, but then these little restriction collars. Now, I'm always amazed because you know I've heard someone say, well, all winter I made these little metal collars and then I put them on the plants. Um, that's wonderful if you have um, not too many plants and they're high value, but if you've got a lot of plants, you're probably not putting them around the zinnias. They're maybe not high enough value, but you might if you've got a really big problem with cutworms. Um, and then, you know, there are things, again, there's biocontrol that's existing in the field as well. So this, this system are, is sort of automatically set up for integration. It's really discouraging, though, after you've got a plant coming in and you come out and they've all been 
cut off and you can see where they cut them off, little fiends. And here's the idea of row covers. So in this case, the plants are planted in the field and then there's a, a row cover of spun bottom polyester or something else put over the plant. Um, it's good for flea beetles and, and Lepidoptera, so butterflies and moths to keep them from laying eggs on the plants. Water does get through and the sun enough sunlight gets through. So you can actually produce a good crop in there. Figuring out high, how high your hoops need to be based on the how high your crop is, is one thing that you need to think about. And then timing. Often it's something where you'll get good, you, you put it on for good early control. So you've got good growth of the plants and then you take it off when you're harvesting because you just can't harvest. You just can't keep taking this off and putting it on when you're harvesting every day. But it does work really well um, for a lot of different pests. This is the next level. And this just amazed me when I heard people were actually putting bags on each bud <clears throat> for dahlias to keep tarnished plant bug off them. Um, it is uh, just, I mean, you could use floating row covers, but these will these tarnished plant bugs will get on the buds and damage them. So there are some people that are actually putting but covering up each bud individually more power to them, but that's also helpful because dahlias are pretty high value. Then with mulches, you might put down an organic mulch like straw, make sure you know the source so you're not adding weed seeds into your field and they will always require continuous renewal. Um, landscape fabric, you might put down on walkways to keep weeds out of there, you might plant into it. Some things that we're always looking at are how do you keep it down so the wind doesn't pick it up and take it away and pull your plants with it. Um, this is an interesting one. Heirloom Soil flower, Florals is in Western New York and they're using a, a paper mulch. Um, there are some other um, biodegradable bio plastic mulches. The problem that I've heard of and seen with them is they break down, but they break down into little pieces of plastic, but they don't break down into infinitesimal pieces of plastic. So now you've got this sort of chunks of plastic in your, in your soil and it's hard to get rid of it all. Um, so that might be something that you consider. Many of the of the landscape fabric mulches that are where they use where you're planting into them, um, you're either planting in the same places year after year or it's a perennial crop that's in there. You can get weeds growing through the holes, but you can also get weeds growing on the top as soil sort of builds up on the top of the mulch. Um, and so you do need to think about how they're going to affect water and soil temperature when you're using them. Um, and then physical is it, cover crops are another source of sort of physical management in that they're, I guess you could consider them either physical or cultural. They're kind of competing with the weeds, um, but also sometimes there, there is a toxic element in there that's actually killing the weeds. There are lots of different cover crops you can see from this little diagram. And so what are you looking for? Are you looking for uh, summer versus winter? Are you going to have to figure out how to kill it once it's grown up so you could roll them or some of them just die out? Some you till in, some you just plant into the residues. Um, you want something that's going to cover ground quickly, but you also want to make sure that whatever you're planting as a cover crop doesn't become a weed. Okay, now we're up to biological. We're moving along here fairly well. Okay, last year I tried ryegrass between my beds and mowed it all summer and found it very effective. Yeah, and that's the thing is I love the fact that people will share information. Um, rye is interesting. It does have some allelopathy. And I wonder, did you see any effect from the rye on the, on the edges of the crop plants? Um, and sometimes people don't want to mow it all summer, so they might have just grown it and then rolled it and left it there and walked on it. Um, and it would probably also help reduce the weeds. So biological, no, I did not, okay, good, <laughs> thanks. Uh, sanitizing landscape fabric was year, used year after year. Yeah, it's a tough thing. I don't know that it ever gets sanitized. It may get cleaned off. Um, trying to actually wash it would be, I mean, I suppose maybe depending on how long it is, you could spray it, but I think getting really getting it clean, clean. So what I would probably be more likely to do is pay attention to any diseases that I have on plants that are on my landscape fabric and either switch out the plants that I'm growing in it or if you had something that was an issue, not using that again. Now, if it's if it's been used for one year, it's tough to say that you only want to use it one year. So I, I might 
again, this is a record keeping thing where you need to know what went into it and you need to mark that piece of, of fabric so that you're not putting the same plant in there again, depending on what the disease is. Because if it's in the soil, then that's another whole nother problem. It might not just be on the, on the uh, landscape fabric, but that's a great question. So biological control is near and dear to my heart. I like both aspects of it. So we have both genetic resistance, which tends to be more for diseases than insects, and then natural enemies, which tends to be more for insects. There's some for, for diseases. And so the big thing for biological, there are two big things for biological control that's using the biological control that's already out there. There is an amazing amount of biological control going on that you never notice because the things are under control and you just don't see them. The only way you know that you that you had it is when you lose it. Like if you spray a pesticide that actually kills off your beneficials. Um, so even if you use are using pesticides, you can still either find out information on what the effect they have on the beneficials is, or if you're not spraying the whole field, you will get reintroduction from other parts of the field. The other parts of the field will act, act like refuges. So the big thing is knowing what they look like. So we're, we're used to seeing the hoverfly adults out in flowering crops all the time. But if you saw this little cutie, you might not realize that it's happily eating your aphids. In this picture, you can see it sucking the guts out. Um, but you might think, oh, well, that looks like something terrible. Um, again, this one, you're probably not going to see the adults. This is an aphidious wasp, but you might see um, aphid mummies. And last summer was an amazing aphid year. And I had aphids on a cup plant and they're like, just the leaves were covered and they're red and they were all wiggling together. Less than a week later, I went out and there were uh, mummies, there were ladybug larvae, and there was something else out floating around out there that was eating them. And less than a week after that, there were the only aphids left were mummies. So mummies are means that this is it had laid an egg in the aphid. It's grown up in the aphid. It's eaten the aphid out from the inside. And then actually a wasp was going to come out the back end. So this one, I can kind of tell, has a hole in the back end. So it's actually produced another wasp to go start it all over again. If you see something like this on a hornworm, leave it because these are all um, beneficial insects. They're pupae and they're all gonna hatch out. So we have quite a lot of things that are going on out there. Here's a few more. You might not know what lacewing larvae look like or lacewing eggs. Uh, if you see this, you might freak out and think you've got some pests, but that's actually ladybug eggs. And this is a ladybug larva. And you know, if you see a fly, you're probably not gonna worry too much because we got flies all over the place, but you might not realize, whoops, that it's gonna lay eggs on a, a, a caterpillar. So it might actually control your caterpillars. No longer suppliers in the States, but in Eastern Canada, there's a whole mix up about annual ryegrass and perennial ryegrass and lack of identification or differentiation. So you could end up with a perennial cover crop by accident, unless you find a reputable and well-informed source for your cover crop. That's really interesting. I have not heard that for the US. I don't know that anyone else has, but that's a big deal <laughs> to not know whether you've got perennial or annual. Um, so yeah, make sure you know who you're getting your stuff from, I think, I guess is the answer there. So how do you encourage beneficial insects? Uh, in greenhouses, we tend to add them and it's not impossible to do that with some of them out in the field, but it's much better to actually not kill them with pesticides and then provide habitat and food source to encourage the populations. Now you've got you've got flowers out in your field, so you've got nectar sources and you've got pollen sources, so you're in a in a pretty good position anyway. But sometimes people will put in things like alyssum. Often there are plants with a lot of small flowers that are really good at providing habitat uh, for beneficial insects, and then um, weeds will actually work if you've got some weeds with small flowers. Uh, and so you know that anything that you're doing to provide them with what they need to survive will help encourage the numbers. Uh, paper mulch, I'm using three to four layers on difficult to weed flowers like status successfully. Great, thank you for putting that in. And so, you know, that's again, finding out what other people are doing um, and, and Heritage Soul really likes the paper mulch. Um, so, it, and it may break down differently than the plastic, the biodegradable plastic also. Uh, and then the other part of genetic resistance is host plant resistance. So you can see this row, this is um, verbena, which is not the cut flower, but you can see this row looks much different than the rows beside it. So this one is powdery mildew resistant. 
and the other two next to it uh, both have powdery mildew. So it's not just a question of if there's no powdery mildew, it looks good. There's powdery mildew in this field. So it's actually genetically resistant. And we'd like more, we'd like to be able to find out the information on that. And I've been working on it. I just don't have them out yet. So we've got this list of, of uh, plants that we got the draft anyway. Ooh, this is a terribly fuzzy picture. But what we have is we started with uh, perennials. So we have this disease and insect resistant ornamental plants fact sheets. And the idea is any information that we can find on any of the diseases and insects for which there is resistance, we're putting them in the fact sheet. So I'll let Hannah know when I've got them and um, she can tell everybody. And the only thing I'm going to say about pesticides I really is um, just think of what to think about when you're using them. So we want to make sure that you have a pesticide that works. They don't all work the same way. They don't all work on all crops the same way. And they don't all work on all pests the same way. So make sure that you're getting information and that you know that it works. Also know what the um, what the risks are. I don't know. Actually, Jonathan maybe can answer what kind of paper is in the paper mulch. Um, make sure you know what the risks are both to you and to the non-target organisms. Make sure you know if there are residues. Again, you're the one who's going to be contacting the most, but also for your customers. I mentioned non-target organisms. Make sure you know if you're using them, the timing and whether how that relates to the stage of the insect or the disease. And think about methods to reduce the amount and frequency of use. As I said, starting with a basis of, of cultural and physical control, knowing things like, is it a hot spot or is it through the whole field? Um, and so you can you can apply them just where you need them. And again, it's like, okay, there's a whole bunch of information I just told you you needed. <laughs> so whoops. there is uh, the New York and New England Management Guidelines for Greenhouse Floriculture and Herbaceous Ornamentals is published. I know we can get it, you can get it through the Cornell Bookstore online. Um, it probably is available some way through UMass. I'm not sure at this point how to, to tell you what to do, but Hannah probably can figure that out. Um, it has a lot of information on what you can use, how much to use, what it's labeled for. Now, New York and New England labels are not always the same. Ours are usually a little more strict, um, but not always. But the other thing that this book has that's amazing is how much um, integrated pest management information it has. So it'll tell you things like only under warm, wet conditions. Um, and then here's cultural practices that you can use to reduce the amount of the disease. So uh, it, it's a very useful resource. And then this one I hear about all the time and the picture reason there's a picture of Dawn dish detergent is the most commonly thing, thing I hear about people using. And I think it's because it's got a duck on the, on the label or something. There's two things. If you're using it as a pesticide, at least by New York state law, it must have a pesticide label on it. So Dawn dish detergent does not have a pesticide label. Now there are insecticidal soaps and you're like, well, it's a soap, right? Yes, but insecticidal soaps have been tested and there are still some plants that they will burn. But Dawn dish detergent is meant to take greases and oils off and that's what the surface of a plant is covered with. And I, whenever I tell this, I, I did it, I was doing a talk and I mentioned it and I got an email right away from somebody saying, yep, I toasted a whole field of zinnias with using Dawn dish detergent. So don't. <laughs> and you can find it listed on the, online all over the place. You can find a lot of stuff um, listed all over the all over the place on the internet and be really, really careful. Yeah, so the, the New England doesn't um, New England doesn't currently have uh, pest management, but actually now we've combined. So New York, it is New York and New England, so they are now joint. Um, pyrethrum or BT use positives from organic garden centers, but negatives from organic farmers themselves mostly about pyrethrin. I have major issues with Asiatic beetles and hand picking is next to impossible. Um, BTs are lovely. They're relatively soft. They're pretty, uh, they're, they're pretty directed at just the single, just, um, well, there's different kinds of BTs, but often we use them for lepidopterous pests. Um, there are issues um, on almost any pesticide you can use. And if it's one of the things, if you have a major issue with something and don't have any other way to control it and those work for you and you're okay using them, I, you know, it is certainly something that's perfectly sensible to do. Um, you, what are your other options is like, well, then you don't grow those things or you find other, other ways to control them. 
It's interesting to hear Asiatic beetles because I almost always hear Japanese beetles as the question that everyone wants to know how to control those. And so Japanese beetles, we have very good lures for them. They're very attractive to Japanese beetles. Unfortunately, they don't all go into the traps. So if you're going to use something like a Japanese beetle trap, don't put it near your, your cut flowers. Put it somewhere else so that it will pull them far away. Um, and so yeah, so you're using spraying at night when the other things are not out. Um, the bees are... The bees are not out then either. And the pyrethrins, I think should, I have to look up and find out about residues. They're not systemic, so that will help. Um, rescue is, oh, somebody makes a trap for Asiatic beetles. Yeah, they um, they also have pretty good hormones or pheromones to attract them. Again, I would say the same thing is true is don't put the traps near your plants make them go somewhere else. And most of those beetles, the problem is um, you can control the grubs in the soil, but then the beetles fly long distances. So you can have really good control in your property and they'll fly over from somewhere else. And they often lay their eggs in areas that are um, irrigated. So one of the farms that had all the cut flowers <laughs> at Cornell was right next to the golf course where they irrigated. So we had amazing Japanese beetle issues out there. Um, and then back to the point of how do you know if your management system is working, write down what you did, both the method, the rates, the timing, and anything else, but also write down if it didn't work and if you can figure out why. Yeah, so BT wouldn't affect beetles, you're right. Um, I don't think there's any BTs that are for beetles, but the usual one, um, yeah, you're using it for cabbage moss, yep. Um, Yes, and then so it great. it's great that it's OMRI approved, but it doesn't work very well. So that goes back to the, the making sure that you know if it's effective. All right. So yeah, keep putting questions in because the information is until people are ready to go, I'm happy to answer questions um, because sharing information is the most thing, useful thing you can do. Actually, I'll stop this and then... Um, this you don't have probably much problem with this because you're probably unless you're growing lilies this is a lily leaf beetle but you guys are lucky in that if they brought in the beneficials into massachusetts i think and they've been working well where we have only done it a little bit in new york and we don't have them yet diatomaceous earth for pet or er, diatomaceous earth for pest control um there are some things that it works really well on um, be, remember that it is a, a respiratory hazard and if you're using it please wear a mask um, it doesn't work on, I, I'm sometimes surprised by the things that people use it on because it doesn't seem like it should work on those. Um, but I, I read about it a lot. Um, and Jessica, lucky you, lily, lily beetles in, in the finger lakes. Yes, we have lots of them. We, we hope, we're hoping there used to be someone in, um, Rhode Island that was producing the beneficials and we got them from her for a while. We did some releases, although not in the Finger Lakes, um, but they just, someone from Michigan, just Minnesota just came out last summer to look for the beneficials and didn't find any around here. Uh, so I have difficulty with annual asters yellowing and dieback. There is uh, something called aster yellows, which I think is a, a phytoplasma, kind of like a virus. Um, but it might also be a root rot. Um, it's one of those where the specifics, I, you know, um, pictures are good and a little bit more information is probably helpful. Stink bugs on snapdragons, <laughs> yes, besides basically hand picking. That one I don't have, so someone else might. Um, oh, 80, 80 pound blank new produce print in rolls. Yep, put a cable in them and pull. Rosemary and dormant oil solution with hose and sprayer effective on roses. What for? I've been skishing them and they're awful. This is Lily Leaf Beetle and they're awful eggs as fast as I can, but I can't always keep up. Yeah, and the adults are hard to catch. The disgusting larvae, which cover themselves with fecal material, are much easier to catch, but much less pleasant. Maybe I want to talk about a, an unpleasant adolescent. <laughs> yes. Lily Leaf Beetles have them. Um, Increasing bricks levels in plants for making plants less palatable for pests. I can't quite imagine. I think I heard about that once and, and 
I don't understand. So increasing Brix levels, basically Brix measures the sugars. So when I was working on squash and we were trying to make baby food, we wanted high Brix squash because it was sweeter. And I don't know why that would make a plant less palatable for pests. Um, again, maybe yeah, I would imagine else. that would increase the palatability. Yeah, could be leaf hoppers on asters. That's true, and I think they can't carry the aster yellows. Um, neem mixed with spinosad, and again, always check to make sure that it's on the label. New York, we have to have both the pest and the site production site like cut flowers on the label and it makes life really difficult um i don't know massachusetts whether they you have quite the same um same issues is there something new in so yeah paper mulch i think can be from recycled paper i'm not sure it always is but it get it get depend it's it's going to depend on so, if somebody's producing recycled paper in those rolls to be able to pull out, then, um, then you could use it that way. I mean, you can you can use paper in other ways besides having it on a roll. But having it on the roll is is really nice if you've got long rows and you're trying to use paper as a mulch. We're reading up the bricks, but they can't digest the high amounts of sugars. Yes, but if you think about I don't know, because, you know, aphids pull in, a, any sucking get pests pull in a lot more sugars than they use, and they just put it out their back end. That's where we get the honeydew from. So they pull the, they pull the proteins out. Now, um, and the question is whether you can get it high enough and what else it's going to do to the plant. I don't know. It's an interesting question because, you know, just because I can't think of a reason why it might not work doesn't mean it doesn't. I haven't seen much research done on it and i'd like to see some more so um to see if you know under what conditions they're thinking it works and and for what um so as i say I, like sucking pests wouldn't seem like it should be um, um yeah it can be associated with pest type so a sucking insect to me would seem like they can suck it in and you know um and just poop it out. So it probably wouldn't work for them, but it might work for some other kinds of chewing insects, for example. Rosemary oil for black spot aphids and beetles. Um, again, oils, you can burn things with oil. So just be careful about when you put them on. Timing is really important. And there are horticultural oils that again have been tested and that have um, some of the, some uh, more information with them. Slugs under black fabric. I use biodegradable black plastic that doesn't leave pieces behind. Oh, that's cool. And someone's saying that slugs will thrive underneath and wreak havoc. If I didn't see this when I used the plastic for my melons last year and was thinking of expanding my use, but slugs are not what I'm looking to introduce. Did you see, you didn't see any, any evidence of slugs? Um, yes. I mean, we talk about slugs under boards. If you leave boards around, they like, keeps it, uh, it keeps it um, moist. And so they're happy there. Um, so it's a possibility. Now the fabric is going to let more air and water through. So it may not be as bad as, as something like having wood down and, you know, I'm spitballing a little bit, but I can, if you, if you didn't see it, I'd say, keep using it until you do low level bricks seem to be associated with aphids where 10 would tend to associate with beetles. Huh, well, yeah, I don't know. I will say uh, you can increase your aphid numbers by over fertilizing your plants. They do like high fertility levels. If you roll it out in relation to wind direction, recommending, well, it depends on which direction your wind is. So just have your rows in the same orientation as your wind. So the wind can kind of blow down the rows. Now, sometimes there, um, you know, there are other reasons why you don't do that. But in terms of just talking about just wind direction and getting good ventilation in your rows, that's the way to do it. Yeah, they did like the boards I was using to hold on the plastic. Yep. Actually, I I did, I, oh, yep, sorry. Wait, that was, someone had a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, a couple of, oh, sorry. Oh, let's see, let me just quickly say we've reached, three, so it's 335, so we're officially yep. done. But I want to let people, they're welcome to stay. We have more questions in the chat. Um, so we could stay a little bit, but just quickly say thank you everybody for joining us yeah. um, keep an thank eye out so for an email from me next week um with the recording and information about future uh, webinars and thank you so much to betsy for 
uh, sharing all this information with us. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, please feel free to stay on to, to ask more questions, but just in case folks had to hop off about now. Yep. And, and there are still some people there, so their heads didn't all explode. So <laughs> exactly. talking about nettle tea for tarnished plant bug. I have not heard of that. Um, I don't know if anyone else has. You know, we try, we'll try anything up to, you know, I think it's kind of the thing when you've got a pest like tarnished plant bug or um, Japanese beetle, people will try all sorts of things. And some of them do work. Um, and some of them work for some people. And so again, it's kind of like, I, you know, with nettle tea, how much, how many nettles are in there and all sorts of different things. So um, it gets a little confusing, but yeah, we'll have to do this again and again. Everybody come back and report on what they tried, except that I don't want to hear that you tried something that just totally bombed. Um, any specific books you recommend to cover this topic? Oh, that's a great question. And I don't have that any of the titles just on the top of my head. I found, and maybe Hannah sort of seen the same thing. I'm I'm interested that there's a lot of information out on cut flowers now because we have so many growers coming in, but there's really not a ton of information out there on pest management. Um, so that's why I've decided to take that little flag and fly it myself. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of information about vegetable pest management that you can apply to cut flowers and in some and cases the resources I haven't come across yet either but yeah anyway just adding on the way you're saying let's just see what happens if I click on this yeah there's organic insect and disease management from Cornell that's the link that someone just put in um and so again they they should be fairly transferable, but not always. And Jonathan has eggshells around bases of most starts. Again, that's the concept of a physical barrier. And so things that are crawling over the surface will um, be affected by eggshells. On a large scale, you, you have to eat a lot of eggs, maybe if you have chickens. Um, but anything that flies in won't be, um, won't be affected. And so that does have the review of the OMRI pesticides and how they work and what type of pests. For New York, we would have to make sure that they were also labeled for cut flowers. Uh, recommended treatment for flea beetles. Radish is a trap crop. And then uh, we didn't, I didn't have there. Again, if you can keep them out of your crop, that's one of the best things. The other thing is looking at uh, floating row covers was another thing. Um, and so... Um, there are, I think there are also some chemis chemistries that you can use for flea beetles. Natural pest and disease control from Rodale. Yeah, it'd be nice if we'd start seeing some that was specifically aimed at, at cut flowers because now like, like vegetables, um, you've often got a lot of different species there. Cut flowers sometimes even more. And sometimes with cut flowers, it's frustrating because you can get one variety that doesn't seem to get the pest and the next variety will. And when you start using new varieties, you don't always know which ones are going to be affected. So it makes life <laughs> much more. You, you don't go into cut flower production if you're not <laughs> entrepreneurial, brave, and kind of pig-headed. <laughs> it's the best way to be. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. You're supposed to be 60 here. <laughs> Over here too. Nice here too. Yeah. Yep. Well, thanks again, everybody, and thanks again, Betsy. And uh, we look forward to maybe seeing you all uh, next week. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And if you get questions that they send to you and and you want work on answers, I'm happy to help with it. that too. Fantastic. Great. And we can put your email in when we send a follow up email. We can yeah, put your great. contact info. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Have a great weekend.